even though the demand is impossible, Daniel's going to get killed, along with the magicians, suddenly Daniel says, wait a minute, King, give me your ear. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We discover something about Daniel. He is a man of faith. We'll talk about it in five minutes time. In 20 minutes time, Corey and Ryan are coming up. Corey, what's going on? I'm going to take a historical look at infamous King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Ryan? Today, Daniel goes on a strictly vegetarian diet, but be careful because the takeaway lesson here may not be what you think it is. That's right. Very, very good. I've heard a lot of people talk about Daniel's diet, but anyway, that's good. What did you do, Jan? Today, my segment is Nothing is Impossible with God. Absolutely. Well, Daniel knows that, and uh, it's put to test coming up in just a moment. Take your Bible guide out, take your Bible, and let's learn what God said to us. Daniel 2, 14 through 24. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Daniel chapter 2, verses 14 through 24. It is the book of Daniel. I'll tell you, this is a great man. It's a great book and the prophet is amazing. Now, the book of Daniel is a short but powerful record of God's provision to a society that had lost everything and became captive. Now the time is about 575 to 580 years before Jesus Christ was actually born. God's chosen people are highlighted in this book at a time when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, besieged Jerusalem and took it captive. Along with some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, and other young men like Daniel, who were gifted, handsome, and wise, were taken captive to serve in the king's palace. Daniel would be trained in the language, in the religion, in the art, and the culture of Babylon for service to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's book is short and to the point. Historical stories between Daniel, his companions, and the rulers of Babylon frequent its pages. From chapter 7 to chapter 12, Daniel has visions, some of which land him in a lot of inner turmoil because God reveals the truth about the future of his people Israel and the places in which they'll go and how they'll return. 
Daniel becomes very concerned about this. Let me tell you, it's really important. Now, if you have your Bible guide, turn to it today because it's important. It, it covers, it's got about 40 pages and it covers all of the information that we cover each day of the month. It's good. And uh, if you're not on the list, call us or write to us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and uh, get on the list because it's important as we go through the Word of God, the Bible, today especially becomes very important. Today, the dream of the king, Daniel 2, 14 to 24. And we're going to read first, Daniel and his friends obey God. Then Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which is what we're going to read today. And then God reveals Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then we read Daniel explains the dream. Won't go that far. And uh, it's very, very interesting. And then Daniel and his friends are promoted as a result of it. Let's pray in the name of Jesus Christ so that we can learn. Father, we pray today as we study the Bible that you would teach us your word by the power of the Holy Spirit and help us, Father, today in Jesus' name as we seek your face and uh, guide us and direct us. And, and we said together, amen and amen. Now, let's look at this because it's interesting. Daniel 2, verse 14. 14 to 16, then with counsel and wisdom, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, that was Nebuchadnezzar's guard, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answers and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation of the dream. Daniel does not give up when he's faced with death. Daniel does not give up when the king demands the impossible. Tell me the dream. Daniel will appeal to the mercy of God for the answer. This is so important. Daniel was faced with the reality because the king had said, just kill them all. Kill they, I told them, they got to tell me what the dream says. Nobody can. So he says, just kill them all. And so he goes out to kill them all. Daniel says, why, why are you doing this with such speed? He says, well, because the king commanded it. Daniel says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I will tell. It's so great. I will tell the king his dream. He, he answers, very important, okay? Now, we got to go back to the next passage in chapter 2, verse 17, because here's what it said. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. So that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Let me tell you something right now. Daniel and his friends seek the Lord for the secret. And God gives it to him. He answers prayer with God all. Things are possible. Let me tell you something. We have a prayer meeting. We see answers to prayer all the time. Now, I know everybody's busy and they got a thousand things going on. But let me tell you something. When you make time to pray with us, 3 o'clock or 3.30 rather, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 3.30 Eastern time in America, 3.30 Eastern time in America, you join us. God will answer your prayer. Because God said it, God does it as we pray. Very very important. Daniel's prayer was answered. Now, watch what happens. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 20, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. Did you hear that? He, God, changes the times and the seasons. Very important for us to hear that. He removes kings and raises up other kings. Did you hear what that says? He removes kings and raises up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. 
And he reveals deep and secret things, deep and secret things. He knows what it is or what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and he said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king its interpretation. I mean, this Daniel was something else. I, I want to tell you, it's amazing. Daniel praises God for giving him the answer, saving his life and the life of the wise men of Babylon. When we move in God's will, people's lives change from death to life. Look, I, I want to tell you the truth. The, the scripture tells us this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And the power of the tongue is, Lord, we pray. Show us your way and teach us your paths. We're going to go in those paths, not our own. We're going to, because, because you, Lord, have prepared your paths. You know the direction of those paths and you've protected it. So we've got to get with your protection. I'm not going to go with what I want. I need to go with what you want. Do you hear that? Do you see how important it is for you to follow God? So we need to pray and say, Lord, show us your paths and teach us how to walk in those paths your way. Holy Spirit of God, come into our hearts and show us that right now. In Jesus' wonderful name. And we have to pray this way because if we don't, it's easy to lose it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This character of King Saul, this historical figure. Now, I think it's probably fair to say that most of us when we think of King Saul, we think of the bad guy foil to King David. But an entire book of the Bible is also dedicated to mostly his reign. Of course, that's 1 Samuel. So I'm really excited to jump into it today and see what we can learn about Saul. Well, I call this segment today the Daniel Diet because I'm focused on Daniel chapter 1 where Daniel and his three friends who had recently been deported to Babylon choose not to eat the king's meat and drink his wine because it was defiled, which means that it was dedicated to idols. Now, Jewish law strictly forbade eating such things, so instead they ask for vegetables and water. And surprisingly, after only 10 days, the Bible reports that they looked healthier than those who were on a diet of meat and wine. Now, not surprisingly, this passage has been used as a number of different diet plans in order to lose weight. But I submit to you that weight loss is a lesson the Bible never intended to teach, at least not in this passage. So grab your August Bible Discovery Guide and turn to page 5 to follow along with me. Let's study. In the modern Western world, where overeating and obesity is a huge problem, many have naturally become preoccupied with overcoming this through proper diet and exercise. In fact, many have even used the Bible to help formulate special plans to promote better health. One of the most popular passages used is Daniel chapter 1, where Daniel and his three friends honor God by refusing to eat the royal meat and wine which were devoted to idols. Instead, they consumed only vegetables and water. Interestingly, after only 10 days on this strictly vegetarian diet, the NIV version of the Bible reports that Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. While those who adopt this Daniel diet model into a weight loss program are certainly well-meaning, unfortunately it is a total misapplication of this scripture for at least two reasons. The first thing to note is that the description of Daniel and his friends in the NIV as quote, better nourished, is a translation of the Hebrew word bari, which actually means fat. That's why the more literal ESV and KGV translations say that they were better in appearance and quote, fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So they hadn't lost weight, but rather gained it on Daniel's diet plan. 
They had expected a diet of only vegetables to leave them thin and weak, but God honored their faithfulness to Jewish dietary law and avoidance of meat sacrificed to idols, so that they miraculously put on weight instead. Secondly, those who claim this Daniel passage is giving instruction on weight loss have inadvertently extracted a lesson from the Bible it never intended to teach, by forcing their own Western views upon it. Indeed, while weight gain might be considered a negative thing in the West, in the ancient Near East where famines and food shortages run rampant, being fatter in flesh was seen as a sign of prosperity. This positive view of gaining weight can be seen in Song of Songs chapter 7 verse 2, where Solomon praises his beloved's beauty, specifically noting her plump and curvaceous belly. He says, Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Certainly, as temples of the living God, the Lord wants believers to eat right and avoid gluttony. But to search the Bible for secrets for slimming down is to read it upside down and backward of what it meant in its time. Now, today's segment is a good illustration of why we, especially those of us in the West, have to be really careful not to subject the Bible to our own Western cultural views, because we may inadvertently draw out lessons that aren't there. Middle Eastern culture is completely different from Western culture. As today's segment showed, although weight loss is viewed positively in the West, where overeating is a real issue, in the East, where famines run rampant, it is weight gain that is viewed positively. That's why the literal translation of Daniel 1.15 describes Daniel and his friends as healthier looking people who were, quote, fatter in flesh than the rest of the men. And that's why it was such a shock to the Babylonian official, because normally a diet of strictly vegetables and water would have made them unattractively thin in the eyes of that culture. But God honored Daniel's decision to remain true to his law, and so he miraculously made them fatter. Now, don't get the wrong idea here. The Bible isn't promoting overeating and bad health. Remember that I also pointed out in the segment that the Bible speaks negatively of gluttony as well. But the main point and takeaway for us today is that we have to be careful not to draw out lessons that the Bible never intended to teach. Yeah, that's really true, Ryan. And uh, in the Bible guide, this particular uh, piece is uh, mentioned here today, and that's what we do. Uh, we put that in the Bible guide as well. So there's a lot of good things in here. I wanted to remind you of that. Right now, Corey, what's going on? Okay, well, you and I are going to be taking a look at Nebuchadnezzar. He has featured several times in the scriptures thus far up until our reading. So in Daniel chapter 2, we're seeing uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the first recorded dream in Daniel of him. And we had this really interesting interaction between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. But already in the scripture, we know that Nebuchadnezzar was the one who not only deposed King Jehoiachin and of, of Jerusalem and Judah and took him captive in exile into Babylon. He has exiled at least two waves of exiles by this point in time in Daniel. Uh, he has also appointed the king of Jerusalem who will prove to be the final king of Jerusalem, and that is Zedekiah. Really interesting guy. So let's take a look at what we can learn from history about him. The Bible's portrayal of the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting one. From the perspective of the people living in Judah and Jerusalem, he was a fearsome and war-savvy enemy to whom the prophets of God said they must bow one way or the other. To the first wave of noble exiles that were trained in his courts, Nebuchadnezzar was their new king, and he's portrayed in ways that demonstrate his pride, anger, and eventually how he was humbled with a bout of what today would be labeled as mental illness. The Bible also mentions Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian building projects, specifically as a source of pride for this ancient king. In the history recorded outside of the Bible, we see a similar picture emerge with even more detail. Nebuchadnezzar II was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. With military might and strong alliances, these two men led Babylon to decisive military victories over the dominant Assyrian Empire. Eventually, they completely destabilized it, defeating its leaders and taking its place as the new world power of the ancient Near East. When Nebuchadnezzar took the throne, he solidified his power by crushing rebellions and taking his place as the shepherd of the city of Babylon. 
This meant that he launched huge building campaigns, funded, no doubt, by the spoils of his warfare. And the city of Babylon became a major project. Babylon's main deities were Marduk and Nebo. And one of Nebuchadnezzar's finest building achievements was the rebuilding and refurnishing of their temple structures. He restored the great ziggurat of Babylon that's often associated with the Tower of Babel, and he rebuilt the Temple of Marduk. Nebuchadnezzar also fixed the canal of the Euphrates that passed through the city, and a large processional bridge to facilitate the yearly festival and procession celebrating Marduk's victory and order. Nebuchadnezzar built the inner and outer walls of Babylon, his large palace, and various temples, shrines, idols, and public buildings. This is the background for his boast of being Babylon's creator recorded in Daniel 4. Also notable are the many inscriptions Nebuchadnezzar left behind. Many are dedication inscriptions that he always seems to have ended with prayer. His prayers are noteworthy for his purposeful, humble approach. A king who owes all of his success to Marduk and the gods, a worshiper who wants peace, protection, and to serve the god he's addressing. Interestingly, Nebuchadnezzar II founded what may rightly be called the world's first museum. In a wing of his palace, he displayed artifacts from captured nations, objects excavated from ancient civilizations, inscriptions, statues, and some of his own commissioned work. He opened this collection to be viewed by the public. It testified to all of his supposed worthiness to protect and rule mankind. There we go, a really, really, really interesting figure that we know quite a lot about. So it's that's always amazing when history is able to uh, really bolster the knowledge of a, a historical figure that's also featured prominently in the scripture, because then we get this really nice rounded out uh, picture, more rounded out picture of someone. Very interesting, Corey. Thank you so much for that, uh, Janet. Well, I called this nothing is impossible with God. And you know, I grew up in Sudbury as a little girl, and we would very often travel to Toronto where my grandma and my papa lived, and they attended the People's Church on Shepherd Avenue. And the choir would come out, this grand choir, and my grandma was one of the many, many people, and they would start to sing, nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. And I remember that all these years later. That has stuck with me. Every time I hear that phrase that I can hear that song, I can see the choir come up. What a great testimony. And, and Daniel's life and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was their Babylonian names, their Hebrew names, of course, were Hananiah, Meshiel, and Azariah. They really proved and lived their lives obedient and faithful to the God that they served and the God that they loved. And God showed up for them time and time and time again. That's what we see here in chapter two with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He has a dream and he wants it interpreted, but not only does he want it interpreted, he wants somebody to tell him what his dream was which would to, to, to a human being, to and as you see all of his wise men say, there's nobody that can do that, king. And he was furious. You're supposed to be the wise men. And we know from the this account that Daniel and his friends went to God to ask the impossible and God helped them. We see it throughout the book of Daniel in situations both good and bad. We see him at the beginning of captivity as Ryan had mentioned with the, the Daniel diet that they went on eating not the king's delicacies but lesser staying on vegetables and water and how that God blessed them through that for their obedience to him. We see um, the, the three um, men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, going into a fiery furnace, and the king seeing a fourth person um, in with them, saying he looked like the son of God. Um, and then, of course, Daniel in the lion's den. We see this over and over again. Their lives literally were a testimony to not only the king, but the entire kingdom of the Babylonians and their culture. And what an amazing thing that that is. 
you know, we need to live our lives as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ in that same way, that same faithfulness and that same trust that builds in us that relationship that we have with the Lord in our lives, knowing that that our walk with Him, it doesn't take too backward of a glance for us to see His faithfulness at all. Most times it isn't even a glance backward. It's being held all the time in our heart right away because God is so good. You know, Jesus talked about a wise man and a foolish man in Matthew 7, verse 24. He's talking about building our lives on the Word of God, building our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ versus the things in the world that might sound good, that look good. And and I would submit to you that in the last couple of years, we have seen, especially in the Western world, things that we have depended upon literally fall uh, fall apart around us. Things that we trusted in have fallen apart around us. But you know what never changes? The Word of God and the foundation of our relationship and trust in a faithful God. Listen to what Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and great was its fall. Let's trust in the faithfulness and the goodness of God because nothing is impossible with God. I mean, what is the possibility of God telling you what someone dreamt and then you telling them? Isn't that something? God does that. And Father, I pray today and all of us pray together that you would show us your way and teach us your path. In the name of Jesus Christ, this, we pray, Lord, because we need to know it now. This world is crazy. And we need to identify ourselves with you as citizens of heaven and say, Lord, we follow you. In Jesus' name, this is what we pray. Amen.